Hello, everyone, and welcome to our February SMAC webinar. We have four great talks lined up today. Um, Guerrilla Tactics for Personalization, uh, Turning Ideas to Sitecore Experiences Automagically, Sitecore's Cookies Don't Crumble, and Measuring and Optimizing Omnichannel Campaigns in Sitecore. Um, so we're looking forward to a great session today and just ask that uh, we keep questions till the end if there is time permitting. Um, we can certainly try to, to answer a few um, and you are welcome to use the, um, the ask a question feature inside of GoToWebinar. So without further ado, uh, we can pass it over to our first speakers, Ken and Dennis. And I think we're all here, yeah. I see Dennis's wonderful smile. He's working on his audio. Just want to say thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, work on your audio while I uh, kind of do. And he's working on the presentation deck as well. He's going to share the slides. But Dennis is no, I was, a. Uh, there I, was so sorry. I just was able to unmute myself, and I am going to try to share my screen right here. Yeah. Dennis is a two. Uh, what is it? The Five times strategy MVP or MVP? Yeah, I'm Ken. Uh, I'm a two time strategy MVP. We'll save some time. Um, and been in Sitecore for 10 years and have been doing strategy digital work for about 22 years. Thank you so, for the uh, enduring that, folks. Yeah, Dennis Augustine, as Ken was saying, five times strategy well, MVP, not strategy this time, in the ambassador category, 14 years doing Sitecore, 22 years in the industry. Mr. Gray introduced himself already. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. This is gonna be Absolutely. pretty rapid fire. We're gonna be talking about guerrilla tactics for activating personalization. Uh, we chose the topic uh, guerrilla because it's unconventional and uh, hopefully we'll be able to unblock uh, some people who have been stuck in the phase two. Without, before that though, we'll actually um, shout out to Brucey Juicy, as we call him here at Conobos. Juicy, and uh, they're going to be having their uh, non-virtual, uh, in-person um, pizza quaffing. I don't know, Cody is Coldy is, but neck necking, handshaking, hugging, uh, uh, Sitecore user group uh, session. Um, yeah, so we're not jealous. So, we're not. No, jealous. we're not jealous. Not at all, Bruce. Our, our CN tower is still bigger than your tower, but we're not going to be hating on you for that. Yeah. Uh, we also want to shout out um, this man here, Nick. Uh, Laidlaw, and uh, it's uh, it's Black History Month, and we just really feel that it's important to call out Black side Koreans like Ken and myself, and yeah. people like Nick who really uh, blaze the trail for us um, to set a great example for for those who are coming up behind us. So shout out to Nick at this time, and um, really guerrilla tactics. What was that about? Uh, we wanted to really kind of set the stage that. Um, reset how we're thinking about Sitecore a little bit. It's not just about do, when you're doing Sitecore, it's not just about doing engineering, it's also about how we think about working with the people. And so we're going to try to you know, talk about a little bit about different ways that we can work with the people engineering side of things to affect personalization. Now personalization, of course, is what you probably bought Sitecore for. Um, it's what uh, mm -hmm. the platform is well known for. and really can I mean why do first people personalize well actually there are there are many reasons uh, why they would have chosen Sitecore and uh, honestly the numbers don't lie um, you know uh, organizations uh, with and you can flip through most of this just get right to the end but 96 percent of organizations that implement multivariate testing testing that comes with Sitecore uh, see an increase in conversion rates personalization obviously 93 percent of organizations will see a 19 percent increase in sales cha-ching right uh, and then of course marketing automation and all of these tools are part of Sitecore um, and unfortunately uh, not many of them um, implement uh, these these features. And I'm not sure why, Dennis, do you know why? Well, I mean, we hear the same reasons. I think you've heard it over uh, over the course of our careers. I mean, we That's hear right. things like, you know, we don't have time for that, uh, it's complicated. Uh, we've always done things like this. And I remember working with, um, you know, one partner or an agency rather, who um, had their own UX methodology and we showed them all of the features of, of Sitecore and what they could do with, with the UX um, personalization. But they were like, you know, well, we have our methodology or, you know, we'll leave that to phase two. 
and yeah. uh, that know. phase two thing it never happens. <laughs> it never happens. We all know that it's the mythical phase two. And what we want to really hone in here on is ways that we can avoid phase two by taking on what we want to call guerrilla tactics. Um, mm -hmm. There is no phase two when it comes to personalization. Just like there's no content management phase, there's no personalization phase either. Personalization is something that we have to think about as an ongoing operational activity. And that's why you know we want to take on what we're calling a guerrilla mindset to that. So if you think about warfare, um, you know, you have conventional warfare, which is all about plans made in that back office, and guerrilla warfare is where decisions are made by people on the fields rather than the generals in the back office. Guerrilla uh, tactics are adaptive, uh, and they are things that really enable your business to be very agile. Agile, amen. So, Ken, why don't yeah. you just give us a few things that folks in the in the trenches and you know on the field can do to um, to really get it done now in phase yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know what? Uh, some of these and most of these are fairly straightforward. I mean, we've we've heard of you know the ability to track goals, and and really it's three steps. You know, one define the goal, two assign the goal. So you can assign it to content. You can even assign it to an action taken on a form through submit actions, and then of course you just want to publish those items. And literally, it takes. 15 minutes. So for those so who fast. say they don't have time, honestly, it's it's 15 minutes to set up a goal and assign it to something and then begin tracking. Uh, tracking downloads. This one, uh, a few years ago, I wrote a, a blog post on this and um, I was amazed that you know there was no uh, details out there in search. And so I wrote a post on it, but literally you can upload a media item, anything that you want to have people download and um, essentially click on the uh, an analyze button, click on attributes on the events tab, and you know, click on the download. And within five minutes, you can actually be tracking your downloads. Um, and again, it's very, very quick. And something you can do as a content manager right yep. away in the platform. No need to wait for phase two. Just do that as you're uploading your media items. Uh, profile and tag something. Now, this one takes a little bit more time. Um, because you, uh, and most marketers kind of intrinsically know who their marketers or who their personas are or their target groups are. Um, so if you just pick one of those, uh, you can basically define three to five attributes very quickly within Sitecore um, through the marketing control panel. Um, and then uh, tag, again, tag a piece of content with this profile. And within a few minutes, um, you've pretty much up and running with tracking uh, personas. And then you can personalize based on that. Um, so again, um, if you're not tracking it, uh, it can improve. And um, if you're not doing goals, if you're not doing personalization, if you're not doing um, any of the things we just mentioned, those tactics, then your analytics aren't gonna show you the engagement value and seeing what content works and what doesn't work. 100%, and you know, one thing that we've put here, these are things that content managers and marketing technologists can do today. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we've highlighted here that really, that's something that you can also use to show your own value. Yeah. Um, you know, in your organization, just show that strategic thinking that really lets the data advocate for you. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, something like the path analyzer can zero, zero minutes. Yep, it starts out of the box. Yep, go in there, see what the analytics is showing you, and uh, what the path analyzer is showing you, where people are going. Um, this is one of my personal favorites, Dennis. Um, the ability to actually, as a business analyst, you know, as we're implementing Sitecore. Uh, and creating user stories for the developers, why not bake in personalization criteria right into right the acceptance into the, criteria? Right into the acceptance criteria. So if I'm creating takes, a form, yep. Just right takes a few minutes to do, yep. and you just add that right in there, and it becomes yep. part of what part you of. do. Yep, exactly, as you're implementing Sitecore and itself. And even before we get to that point when we're designing you know, the user stories, we're defining user stories, UX designers can yes. take time and we did a client we did a day in the life of kind of scenario mm -hmm. um, where we can actually show how we can personalize the home page so that you can stop all of those fights about over the home page who owns the yeah. territory there um we're going to be a shout out to a hey, coming up after us and abiel and other contributors from the smack community who contributed to this wonderful white paper that you can download ux for cx so all of you ux designers out there get acquainted with things that you can do um mm -hmm. even before you define any of those stories to help personalization kind of take route in your organization. Yeah, like your hero banner, for example, right? Rather than just showing one version of the hero banner, you can show the three or four different versions of the hero banner 
and then make that part of the story. We're going to you know, implement personalization for each of these different variations. Um, and then, of course, you know, developers in QA speak up and just do it. I mean, you know what Sitecore is capable of. And as Dennis said, um, if it's not done, it's not done until it's personal. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. I, I really love to say that to the folks because, I mean, if we're if you are a developer and you get a story and it doesn't have a personalization aspect on it and you know it's a form, there's no goals or whatever, just realize that you're probably best suited just to raise that as an issue. If you're QA and we're not you taking those things, raise it. Um, mm -hmm. You can, on the ground, affect some meaningful change in your organization. Absolutely. As leaders, um, I want to encourage leaders as well. Um, one of my quotes that I, everybody knows so well, um, we don't want to just, you know, hire p smart people and then tell them what to do. And what Steve Jobs, you know, inspired us to do was to hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. So as leaders, you want to be able to empower, hire, create guerrilla um, personalization kind of advocates in your organization. I'm going mm -hmm. to give a little surprise shout out right now to one in our organization. You might have noted some of our social stuff is coming. Uh, you know, it's really kind of, kind of up the level, Ken, and we want to shout out yeah, Rashna. Absolutely, Rashna is a great asset. Just, just goes right ahead and knows the things to do and just goes ahead and does, does that. Them. So as leaders, mm -hmm. encourage these sorts of people in your organization to really get things going on the ground. Coming up on time, it goes so quickly here. Yeah. But uh, just to recap quickly for you, uh, for that personalization, those guerrilla tactics, um, we know that it works. It's an operational mindset, not a project-oriented project. one. Yes, very important. Absolutely. And remember, it's not done until it's personal. And as leaders, you can hire, create, and empower guerrillas in your organization to get it done in phase one. That's what you, really, what you want to do to be most efficient. Yeah, and we actually have a few resources here. We mentioned the UX for CX white paper, very good resource. Also, you can Google Smack or Sitecore Smack and get uh, a bunch of resources from Smack themselves. We got the partner portal, we got digital marketing resources from Sitecore's website, Knowledge Base. We got, they've got a video gallery of these past webinars uh, from Smack, as well as other webinars on different topics uh, or, or web uh, videos on different topics. And of course, the Sitecore website itself is full of uh, links and of course yeah. we are a resource um, Dennis and uh, myself are always available to answer questions to help you get started figure out uh, you know where the the disconnect is and, and really make an impact in your organization and utilize Sitecore for what it was uh, purchased and designed for okay I want to thank you so much for um, enduring the little technical glitches at the beginning but really again it's a message to you change your mindset personalization you don't need to wait to phase two there's no phase phase two do it now yep. It's part of everything we do. All right. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care. All right. So I think, uh, thank you guys so much for a great presentation. I think next on our list, we have Nabil. All right. So let's move on then to number three, which would be Adam speaking about Sitecore's cookies don't crumble. All yours, Adam. Great. Awesome. You guys can see me. Let me... Um... Okay, so my name is Adam Roboto. I'm the VP of Data Activation at Valir. Valir is an integrated digital agency and a Sitecore Platinum partner, so I encourage you to check us out. Um, the topics I'll cover today are, are um, just kind of one component of a larger blog post I wrote about how Sitecore will thrive in the coming data apocalypse. So I, I cover some changes to the data landscape in regulation, consumer preferences, uh, browsers, technology, and sort of where Sitecore fits amongst all those changes. Um, so today we'll talk about cookies, but there's some other topics worth exploring as well. You can find that on the Valir blog. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about cookies. Um, so the, kind of the thesis of this talk is that to date marketers have been able to get away with kind of a glancing understanding of cookies. Um, you know, they may understand that they're set in the browser and they store bits of information, but that's you know, might be where their knowledge uh, ends. Um, but given some of those changes to the data landscape that I mentioned previously, um, I believe that that we'll need to push a little bit and make sure that our um, stakeholders understand a little bit more about uh, cookies and, and how this might affect different uh, marketing platforms that they're working with, and Sitecore being one of them. So today I hope to kind of bridge that gap a little bit, talk, um, you know, peel back uh, a layer and, and understanding how cookies operate and talk about some of the changes that are coming about that might um, you know, uh, lean into that, that understanding. 
So by the end of today's presentation, uh, we should understand what the difference is between a first and third party cookie, what makes a cookie server side or client side, um, what type of cookies uh, does Sitecore use, and then why does all this matter? So let's start with that last point. Why does this matter? Well, if you or your, uh, your clients depend on any of these features, um, they depend on cookies. So this you know, extends from user login to analytics, A-B testing, advertising targeting, firmographic resolution, remarketing, all of this. It depends on cookies. And, uh, but they depend on different aspects of cookies. And so um, certain features here are going to be impacted to, vary, to different degrees depending on what type of cookies they depend on. So in particular, I'll call out firmographic identity resolution, you know, vendors like Demandbase or Kickfire, they're kind of getting squeezed right now by changes to uh, browser uh, technology, as opposed to something like user login and user preferences, which are not gonna really change anytime soon. Uh, you know, browser implementations of those features aren't gonna change anytime soon. So depending on what features you depend on and depending on how your marketing stack is kind of orchestrated, it's good to have an understanding of how these changes to um, browsers might affect uh, one or more of these features that you're depending on. And, and as proof of uh, you know, some of these changes that are going on in the browser landscape, I would point you to cookiestatus.com. So this is a community initiative uh, launched by the Measure Slack community. Anybody in the analytics uh, community might recognize Measure Slack as a, a place where um, uh, people congregate talking about analytics changes and industry changes. And so I have it up on my screen right here, cookiestatus.com. So it's an open source site. Anybody can con contribute to the um, you know, GitHub code that uh, contributes to this, this site. And it keeps track of the latest implementation across different browsers uh, as they relate to storage, cookies, local storage, um, you know, tracking, those kinds of features. And you, know, you don't have to read any of this text here, but just to show that across different uh, browsers here at the top, it's a varied implementation, right? different browsers are handling things very differently, whether cookies in a third party context, first party context, whether you're using local storage, CNAME cloaking, you know, depending on your marketing technology stack and their deployment of cookies, you will see um, kind of this uh, varied uh, response uh, uh, through these uh, different browsers that your uh, end users are using. So it's good to understand that these changes are happening at kind of a quick pace, the, the browser changes are happening quickly, and it's good for marketers to understand how that might impact you know, their analytics numbers or their deployment of personalization. So let's peel back and talk about just a couple of consideration, uh, considerations about cookies that I think um, you know, are good to understand, good to fill in some cracks here. So first, first party cookies versus third party cookies. So let's talk about first party cookies first at the, in the top row. In this uh, scenario, uh, I visit siteA.com, and siteA.com places a cookie in my browser, and that might be you know, session ID or, or user ID. When I make a subsequent request to uh, siteA.com, I send that browser over to siteA.com so that siteA.com can do something with that information. Maybe it provides me a personalized uh, uh, you know, uh, rendering you know, in response. It gives me a personalized experience. So that's, that's fairly commonly understood, I believe. Third-party cookies may be a little bit uh, less well understood. So in the uh, bottom row here, looking at third-party cookies, I visit siteA.com. It still gives me that same first-party context cookie, the uh, greenish gray cookie there. But say siteA.com also loads uh, in a uh, you know, pixel or some JavaScript from tracker.com. And tracker.com sets this red cookie. This is a third-party cookie on my browser. And what that means is that when I go and make a request for a new website, let's say siteb.com, which could be you know, CNN or some other website, if siteb.com also loads tracker.com, I'm going to send that red cookie over to tracker.com. So the original red cookie that was set here with that original you know, user ID is going to be sent to tracker.com. And this is what enables you know, uh, third-party tracking, uh, remarketing, that firmographic identity resolution is this idea of third-party cookies that can exist uh, across multiple different domains. Okay, and, and I'll talk about why this matters and sort of put it all, all together in terms of how different browsers are affecting these uh, technologies uh, in just a second. But the next um, item I wanted to talk about in terms of, uh, kind of cookie architecture is the distinction between server-side cookies and client-side cookies. So, and I think this is a little bit less well understood than uh, the first party, third party difference. In a server-side context, I make a request to siteA.com, 
SiteA.com responds back to my browser with instructions telling me to set this cookie. Again, unique user ID or session ID. This happens before the page renders. So it's, it's literally in the header of the response. This instruction is sent. And before I see any HTML, see anything graphically, my browser is instructed to set this cookie. Now let's compare that to a client-side cookie. In this scenario, I make a request to SiteA.com. SiteA.com returns the full HTML of the page. I start rendering that page. And in that page is buried this script here, script that says create a cookie. So you can see the difference between these two techniques. In one, the, uh, in the first server side, the cookie is set in the response. And the second client side, the cookie is set using JavaScript after the response is fully loaded. So how do different marketing technologies use these different cookie architectures? And, and again, why does it matter? Well, if we look at this grid here, I can kind of summarize what is changing. I can take that giant, you know, cookiestatus.com uh, grid and kind of distill it down to, I think, what people really care about here. And we can look at the server-side, client-side, first-party, third-party distinction um, all in one view. So you notice that in the top left, there's not much changing uh, for server-side, first-party cookies. And this is considered to be um, kind of the, the most secure type of cookie. It's sent by the server. It's only within the context of the, uh, of the website that you're visiting. Uh, you know, this is how login is handled uh, typically. So not much is changing there, although I do have that asterisk that Firefox will still purge data from uh, known trackers. They keep a list of known trackers, and they'll purge that uh, daily. So uh, moving to the top right here, we have client-side first-party cookies. Here, uh, you're primarily impacted in Safari and Brave, and that's for now. I mean, again, this, this could change moving forward as cookies are kind of waning or on their way out. Um, but right now, uh, Safari will only allow those client-side first-party cookies to exist for seven days, even if you tell them to expire you know, three years from now. It'll wipe them out if somebody doesn't visit that website again for seven days. This impacts tools like Google Analytics. Um, it, it might be surprising to hear that, but uh, Google Analytics is a first party, it uses a first party cookie, but it's loaded through JavaScript. Um, so it is still uh, beholden to this uh, constraint in Safari. So that could mean you see more return visitors, falsely see more return visitors in Safari um, because their cookie's been wiped out. They haven't visited in a while. On the bottom left there, we have uh, third party cookies. So these are, like I was mentioning earlier, are getting squeezed the most due to the tracking capabilities that they provide that I think the industry and consumers have decided over how many years cookies have existed since the beginning of the web, finally sort of come around and said, you know what, that's kind of creepy. That's maybe not something that, um, you know, I want as a kind of default opt-in for you know, these third-party cookies. And so, you know, Safari has been blocking them outright for a while. Firefox with enhanced tracking protection blocks them, Brave blocks them. And the big, the whale here is Chrome. Um, so Google has announced that in 2022, they will also be phasing out their, you know, support for third-party cookies. So they're working on a series of technologies that kind of fill the gaps and allow for retargeting and advertising targeting and things. You know, they want all that to work um, just without uh, cookies as they exist today. And on the bottom right there, there isn't really a, a concept of a client-side third-party cookie. So, uh, we're at a Sitecore talk right now. So where does Sitecore fit in here? Well, guess what? Sitecore relies on uh, server-side first-party cookies to run the experience platform. That means analytics is based off of that cookie. Um, the uh, A-B testing, personalization, uh, you know, reporting, it's all using a first-party server-side cookie. So I think that's good news for you know, folks in the room right now. And this is you know part of that kind of Sitecore being robust to a lot of the data landscape changes right now because Sitecore has good support for things going on like GDPR. And it's uh, because it's a server-side analytics platform, it's not as beholden to say, you know, ad blockers that people are running in their, uh, in their browsers. So generally speaking, Sitecore is fairly robust to a lot of the changes that I just mentioned, as opposed to say a client-side analytics uh, platform like Google Analytics, you know, Adobe Analytics, um, not to say that those tools aren't good and, and you know, there's strengths and, and weaknesses of each platform, um, but, you know, it's, I think it's important to understand the distinction uh, in, in the architecture so that you understand how that might affect downstream decisions or downstream usage of these platforms. Like, you know, is my personalization actually going to show up in the user's browser? Well, if you're using Optimizely or you're using um, Sitecore, you know, that might work a little bit differently depending on the browser somebody's using. 
So just to bring it all together here again, why does this matter? So you know, site core operators should expect more robust analytics that are resistant to these browser changes to, to add blockers, as, as I mentioned, better A-B testing results, because again, it's, uh, it's gonna depend on this cookie and, uh, and the server-side implementation, uh, more consistent a uh, personalized experience and better cross-device uh, identification as well, because again, that across devices, um, you know, you'll be using this uh, first-party server-side cookie. Okay, that's it. Yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. And now we are going to go ahead and hand it over to Nabil. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to just uh, try to keep it as short as possible and to the point. So today I'm going to talk to you about how you can turn your ideas into cycle experiences automatically and how marketers can be empowered with AI no-code platforms. My name is Nabil Orfali. I'm a Sitecore Strategy MVP uh, five times. I've been working uh, with Sitecore uh, since 2008, so it's like 13 years now. Um, I am also the founder and CEO of TechGilts. Uh, TechGilts is a, an, a firm and agency that is focusing 100% on Sitecore, and we, we've been able to, uh, because of our focus, to finish more than 200 Sitecore projects in the last, last six years, small and large. So, um, okay, so today I'm going to just introduce to you the, the concept of no-code or low-code platforms. Uh, I'm going to walk you through what is no-code, low-code platform, what is that movement that everybody is talking about and uh, is increasing, uh, why you should care about it, um, and what's in it for you, and how you can leverage that no-code platforms for your site core uh, uh, marketing activities and and to empower you to uh, uh, to to use that and leverage that uh, that that power so basically in in simple words uh, no code platforms is a development platform that is visual where you can really create apps and experiences with like drag and drop or leveraging artificial intelligence without really needing to write any single line of code uh, without really relying on IT or developers as a marketer, uh, you're empowered to own that. And uh, by 2023, according to Gartner, 50% of medium to large enterprises will have adopted low-code application platforms as one of their strategic application platforms uh, because it's important. And uh, you know, th there is there is an increasing demand on developers in the world, and especially with the pandemic, CIOs has, have been struggling to uh, to hire. Uh, developers to fulfill the needs. 83% of CIOs are struggling to fulfill the, uh, the, the needs for developers, uh, let alone, uh, you know, the, uh, the cycle developers and how, uh, uh, you know, on high demand right now on the increasing uh, cost of uh, and, and salaries for, uh, for developers. So it is, it is a problem. And, uh, let, you know, when, when we have now the, the power of AI, and uh, the ability to automate everything that AI touches, uh, the immersion of uh, AI, sorry, the no-code and low-code platforms are now uh, increasing uh, in the last five years so much. Um, the other thing is like your marketing budget is spent to build the, uh, the in the build phase. So as my fellow uh, MVPs, you know, Ken and, and Dennis talked about the mythical phase two, and one of the reasons for that is that, you know, you spend a lot of your, if not all your budget in the build phase. And then when you get to the personalization uh, or the campaigns, you know, you still need to uh, to go and, and, and pay money to, uh, to adopt it. So why you should you care? Why should you care? Um, so the local platforms or local platforms are gonna empower you as a marketer and business to truly own the experience and truly own the creation of your ideas. You have an idea for a landing page. You have campaigns, microsites. You need uh, to add a component to your component library in Sitecore. You don't have to uh, go through the traditional uh, uh, legacy development process where you know you go to the design and you know the UX design designers and then give it to a developer to do the IA and SA and then you know you put it to a front end developer and then back end development testing launching. You know, twenty thousand dollars later, you have your your component life. Um, with low code, no code platform, you can own that experience. 
Um, the ROI on that is great. Low code is a low risk and high reward. Businesses like uh, Schneider Electric launched 60 apps in 20 months with most delivered in just 10 weeks. So imagine your, your app is delivered in 10 weeks, resulting in 25, 3% ROI in seven months because they're leveraged the low code, no code uh, technologies and platforms. Um, Cycle users, by the way, are not left behind. So all these great uh, uh, technology that is no code, low code, uh, there's an app for that. There is an app, uh, no code app for you. And I'm gonna just, uh, without further ado, try to make it fast and show you uh, how you can really sketch something, uh, a component, a landing page, an experience, and then with the power of AI, you can convert it to a working code, and then you can just uh, add content in the experience editor and then publish it. So um, I am gonna drag this window here. So uh, this is basically a low-code, no-code platform for Sitecore called Kaju AI. It's built by TechGuilds. And I'm gonna show you now how I can upload a sketch that I, I sketch with paint on a My Touch screen. So um, it can be like a, an image title, text, and a button, or like three column component, or a two column component, or product details page, whatever you, you dream of. You know, ideate and then sketch and upload. I'm gonna upload this. And now when I hit create, uh, it's running the wireframe through the AI machine learning algorithm. And it's gonna try to understand my sketch. And now it, it was able to convert my sketch into uh, an interactive working elements. And this is not an accelerator. It's basically just uh, leveraging AI to translate uh, the sketches and wireframes uh, into working uh, web elements. I am going to generate the code. I'm just gonna add a, a container here. You can see now I'm, I'm doing zero coding and the AI algorithm is coding everything for me in the background. And this is the decisions that the algorithm is making. So if I change the layout, it's changing the uh, all the code in real time. So I'm adding this container here just to say, tell that platform that this is really a one cycle component. Oops. Uh, let me make that bigger. So I'm telling the system that this is one cycle component and when you generate the code, you can choose React, View, or Angular based on your stack. You can I generate it? And then it gives me the, the timestamp. Now the code is generated, is stored on the cloud uh, as a zip file. I'm gonna go to my Sitecore demo instance here and uh, click on the Kazoo app. So I can import the generated code. That's the SMAC uh, demo. I'm gonna import it to Sitecore. Now, the the power of that is that you know the AI uh, algorithm and the AI engine now it's what it's doing is uh, deploying all the generated code from scratch to your uh, JSS app. So this is all headless Jamstack um, and uh, recompiling, creating all the data templates, uh, creating the component added to the library, create a sample page, and then add the page into uh, the the component to the page. And then now when it's done, it's gonna open it in the experience editor for content. And you can see now it's gonna take a minute or so uh, because you know a lot is happening in the background. Uh, but when, once it, when it's done, you, you'll see how I can put content and publish that component live, zero code. So um, basically the rise of the no-code platforms uh, is, is on the, in the whole industry, all the enterprise, and, uh, and now it's available for cycle users. So uh, you can truly be empowered right now as a marketer and business user to uh, sketch your page, your landing page, and uh, put it through the platform, get it coded for you using AI, and then put content and launch it. It's taking some time and in the meanwhile, I'm gonna open a different 
uh, thing that I imported in the past and I will show you um, that so we don't really waste time here I think I'm almost running out of time so this is one of the pages that I created with Kaju in the past I'm gonna open an experience editor So this is how it's gonna translate it, right? Like it's a component uh, that you can put content and um, that's a button, CTA, and the image, all the components are interactive and uh, editable in the experience editor. Um, and you can just put content, switch content and uh, publish your page. And it's a component so you can you can see that you can add components here from whatever you generated from Kaju. It's all added to your component library. And actually this is the component still generating. Um, but you, can, you can add any other component, of course, as you would, you would usually do it. So it's all like um, a generic uh, uh, Helix uh, compatible and uh, ready for you to use. And with that, um, I don't want to uh, you know, waste more time waiting for this to deploy. Um, I will just conclude my presentation and thank you so much, everybody. Okay, great. Thanks, Nabil. We are going to hand it now over to our last presenter for the day, Barand. Uh, all right. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, finish um, hopefully, uh, hopefully within 10 minutes. Um, I'm elaborating a little bit more on what Venice and Ken started, but zooming in on a specific part, and that is measuring and optimizing on the channel campaigns in Sycor. Um, my name is Bernard Emmerzel. I'm a digital strategist at Creates. Creates is a uh, digital agency in the Netherlands. We are a gold partner, Sycor gold partner, and I am an, uh, a three times MV strategy. Um, I blog regularly about uh, all kinds of topics around customer experience and digital marketing on Sycor. Uh, so uh, please follow me if you uh, are interested in uh, learning more about the platform. Um, my goal is to help our customers uh, with their ambition in creating customer experience uh, in an omni-channel approach. And Spotify is um, uh, one of the great examples and inspirations for me. They did last year an excellent job by giving me a personalized experience uh, where they used my data with their content and created uh, a cool um, in the app. Uh, experience with a little gamification and it's just a, a really tailored made experience um, that made me smile. They know so much about me but I didn't bother me at all. So this is a great inspiration for me um, and when you look at customer experience um, and I created this model uh, last year um, it's basically around getting four core pillars in place. So uh, no matter what you're doing, you need data, you need content, you need personalization, and you need intelligence in the form of machine learning or AI. So all the other guys just talked about it. Uh, but this is on a high level. Um, and to get started with omni-channel campaigning on Startcore, I want to zoom in on a little, uh, a little part of it. So all of the marketers, uh, of course, uh, recognize this. It all starts with generating traffic right on different channels and from there you want them to trigger certain goals or to make certain conversions um, and the uh, first two actions uh, we're going to focus on that is campaign management and that is digital goals um, and to get started i want to focus on uh, uh, creating goals and campaigns uh, and take three steps to get you guys started so the first one is focusing on collecting um, and like Ken and Dennis mentioned, so I'm not going to explain that, uh, it's very easy to create goals, but also to create campaigns. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in on the taxonomy part because it's very crucial uh, to give the goals and campaigns a little bit more metadata so you can further analyze on it and learn from that. So that's basically step two. Just make sure that you configure some goals and campaigns and then with the tools that are inside or start learning from it just watch what the, what's going on um, and the path analyzer is one of the greatest tools inside core and i will zoom in on that 
uh, in a minute or so, um, because that one helps you really understand how visitors behave on your site, which path they are using, where you need to optimize or where uh, you possibly lose some value. And from there, um, again, like Ken and Dennis mentioned, you can start with simple personalization uh, or A-B testing or profiling. Uh, but for me, it all starts with getting the goals and the campaigns in place. Um, so I'm going to swap screens. Um, are you guys seeing the site for environment? Little check. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so I'm not going to explain how you set up goals and campaigns, but I want to uh, emphasize the importance of the classification of those goals. So both for goals and campaigns, you can set goal facets. And there are a couple of ways you can uh, look, at, look at facet. Um, and one example that I always use is uh, organizational structure. So if you're a multi-brand environment, you can, for example, um, use the brands uh, to classify your goals. So if you have certain goals that specif uh, are specific for um, uh, certain brands or for one brand, then you can select uh, a brand here. Uh, or if you are in a single um, organization and you have different teams working on it or different departments like HR or marketing, you can use those as well. Uh, so it helps you understand if you're looking at the analytics, um, which goals for which facets uh, so you would like uh, how they perform. Another thing that I use often at our customers is uh, a funnel stage. So if you imagine the see, think, do, care model of Google, um, you can, and I'm going to switch back just a little bit. Um, I use this model quite often. Uh, if you have certain actions in the different stages of the funnel, um, and you have certain goals or campaigns that you need to configure for each stage, you can classify them uh, that way. And it helps you understand how uh, engaged people are with certain conversions that you have configured inside or in which uh, funnel stage. Um, there are a couple of other ideas that you can use. Uh, I have written a blog uh, today um, where uh, I have shared some ideas. Um, but what you can do with it is in the experience analytics, when you go to goals and the goal facets, um, you can zoom in on some details. So here you can see the unit team facet and the funnel stage. But if I click the funnel stage, I will zoom in. And here you can see how the different stages uh, uh, perform. So you can look at conversion rates, conversions, visits, and it helps you understand um, the uh, performance of the different stages in your funnel. Um, the same applies for the campaigns, uh, but I'm not going to explain that. Uh, it's the same principle. Just configure your campaigns, think of how you would classify your campaigns by using the campaign facets and um, you can get the same results. All right, the last thing that I want to talk about if you have set up some basic goals and campaigns is the path analyzer. So the path analyzer is a great tool. Let me makes it a little bit uh, easier to see. Um, and it gives a visualization of the different uh, uh, paths that visitors follow on your site. Um, there is something in my view. Um, if you click on reports, then you can see, for example, uh, wh which path has the highest visit, and you can uh, follow these uh, 10 items to see in which order they, uh, they appear. You can change it to highest value to understand which paths have the highest value. Um, and if you click on items, you can see uh, if you leave your mouse on it, which page it is, how many value it created, how many visits, etc. But this is the basic, um, the basic map. So uh, it, that's how it's called, a map. Um, but you can create all kinds of overviews with it. So remember the goals and campaigns, um, and campaigns are good um, to track the external uh, traffic coming from social, social ads, or from search or email, um, because that's the way campaigns are used. So if you have a Facebook ad uh, in multiple variations, you can create individual campaigns. Um, a site work can track and recognize the traffic coming from those campaigns by a unique ID that's added to the URL. 
Um, and with that, you can analyze in the path analyzer how things behave. So starting with goals, um, I have um, uh, a specific, um, no, that was not the right one, I guess. Um, I, let me check where I have data. This is my local uh, demo environment, so I don't have that much data, um, but it's good enough to explain what's going on. So I have created um, a specific map for a specific goal. So let's say that my data model goal um, is the ultimate conversion for my site or for my campaign. So I have created a custom path map where I can see now all the different paths that users followed um, in order to, in the end, uh, uh, convert or uh, trigger this goal, which is my ultimate conversion. So this way, um, I can understand where people uh, start, where they are coming in, and how they receive the goal trigger. Uh, the same thing I can do for example campaigns. So I have a specific campaign, a Google ad, I've created a campaign map for it, um, and this campaign now shows all the behavior in terms of paths um, for this specific campaign. So I can analyze um, behavior for traffic coming from this specific campaign and for this specific channel. I can also do the same on channel level, um, but I want to end with a last one, the experience map. This is a really powerful one. Here I can do a lot more. So what I have created here is, uh, let me apply that, I have created uh, a map where everyone that's coming in from the internet, it's uh, uh, often the starting point uh, within Sitecore for this uh, tool. But in here, I have on the highest level my campaigns. And from there, I can see which goals are triggered in which order. Now, this is a kind of a weird view because I have a local environment with a lot of clicks in random order. Um, but I have used this with a couple of customers and they saw some really interesting things. So they have um, used some Facebook ads um, to cr create and generate traffic. Um, and their expectation was that a certain Facebook ads would perform the best. But in the end, there was another referral channel that created much more traffic and uh, with much higher value. So they understood that the ad spend was not uh, 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 as good as they hoped for. Um, and here you can see that the larger and darker green uh, uh, the item is, it's always explained here. Um, the more value per visit and the thicker the path is, the more traffic. So this way you can understand how campaigns uh, and, and goals from those campaigns on your site, um, how they behave and how they relate to each other. Um, you can do a lot more. Um, if I'm going back to the experience editor for one second to show you, um, if you are... I, this one is better. If you go to the marketing control panel, um, you can create custom path maps there. Um, and with the experience map, uh, it's located under the path analyzer, map, default maps, global maps. And in here, you will see all the sections that I had in the path analyzer. Within the experience map, you can just click and insert experience map. And the same applies for this uh, uh, versions. Um, but I want to show you one thing. Here you can determine what you want to include. So let's say that you only want to include the channels um, with goals that uh, had value, the engagement value, you will get something like this. Um, and if you have set up the classification of your campaigns right, where you can select which channel applies for which campaign, so for example, a social a Facebook post, uh, a social uh, LinkedIn post or LinkedIn ad, you will get an overview of the different channels on the highest level, um, which is this, this level, um, and then whatever you have selected here. Um, and it really helps you analyze those. And one last thing, um, you can use the rules engine inside for as well to filter. So with it, you can zoom in on specific campaigns, specific channels, specific goals, and even specific profiles. Um, and, and at yeah. that, sorry to interrupt, we are at time. 
we have about right. five minutes left. I'll let you finish your sentence though, and then we need to. Oh, that, we need to wrap up. Last, <laughs> no, no worries. That was the last one. So okay. uh, let's finish it with that and back to you, Amanda. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and have Tomas share his screen. Any questions on the four presentations that we had? We are at time, um, five, five minutes left. You can also use the chat as well. Okay, why don't we, if those do come across, we can address them. Why don't we move on? We do wanna highlight that the newsletter and the next webinar are coming out soon. So we do wanna just highlight that these are great ways and channels that we leverage to share knowledge. So please be aware of those, send in any articles and any videos over to us. This is the SMAC members team and the contact email is right there. Awesome, I have a question that's not necessarily related to the talks, but um, do we have a SMAC website or something that we can go to that's specific for SMAC on sitecore.com? What, no, not on sitecore.com, but what are you looking for? What kind of information or what kind of... Uh... Just, a, 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 just a general repository of everything SMAC uh, and strategy related. Because uh, I found that I had to Google and then everything is kind of spread out across the community um, over in different places, but no central place where we can go and get everything that was uh, strategy related for Sitecore. No, not in this sense. I think uh, it would uh, be great if you don't mind just sending some examples what, for example, you were looking for and found in different places to this uh, Smack email address and and uh, maybe the team can, uh, you know, um, look at it and, and figure out if sitecore.com is the right place or we should uh, do it on the community site or we should set up some kind of landing page on the MVP website so we can we can figure out different ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing what um, we shared uh, previously with some folks uh, is that we are working on a unified search project uh, which is uh, indexing all the different um, properties what we have including sitecore.com and the community site and the stack exchange and and the forums and uh, unfortunately we cannot index slack but we are indexing all the documentation and everything what we can so that could be one way to uh, not only use uh, uh, google to to search uh, in sitecore properties but also use this unified search which hopefully comes soon so Again, if you don't mind sending some examples to us, what you were looking for and what is your idea on this one, and we can we can idea it with the team and we can discuss how we can make that happen. Absolutely. I, I just want to offer one thing here. There is a, a LinkedIn group, a uh, SMAC LinkedIn group. Uh, it, yeah. There's like 39 members on it. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a public group or just for the SMAC members, but maybe this is something that uh, we have today that can mm -hmm. be leveraged. So that, that group is for site core strategy and we do only, yes. Oh, okay, so it's a private group. Yes. Very cool. All right, if uh, there are no more questions, thank you very much for all the presenters for today. Thank you, Krista, for helping Amanda, and um, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.